Hey, listen, welcome. I've already been out here on stage, but um, I just want to come back out here one more time to introduce uh, what we're doing in this new series. And of course, I had to change my clothes because it, I, we, we worship Jesus here, yes, first and foremost, but we also have 49er Faithful in the house. And I'm so grateful that all y'all are in church right now. There's a game starting in one minute, and you are here going after Jesus. I'm so impressed, man. I'm so impressed. God is going to be glorified here today. Uh, but for all you Fortnite faithful, yes, we are in this together. Let's get after it. Let's win an NFC championship together. But listen, if you're new around here, again, welcome. You might be here for the first time because you heard about this new series that we are launching today. And I want to be able to just kind of share with you a little bit of what's coming up here in the following month of February. And I think we've got a, I think we've got a chart. This is on the back of your notes as well if you want to follow. So starting next week, there's a brand new series starting today. Next week, we're teaching on, the science, on science and the existence of God. Pastor Jason Kane is here. Uh, Mark Clark will be in the house. Anybody know Mark Clark? Yes. He's got an incredible book uh, called The Problem of God and the Problem of Jesus. And he's going to be teaching on how can God exist if there's evil and suffering. F weekend after that, Pastor Kane is back again. Isn't the church just filled with hypocrites and judgmental people? And then the week after that, faith, doubt, and deconstruction. This is huge right now in culture. And this is going to be taught by our, our newest pastor at Bayside Santa Rosa, Dominic Doan, who's got a master's degree in this in theology from Oxford. And he's getting his PhD from Oxford right now. So he's brilliant. And so we want these teachers, if they are available, to be here teaching us uh, that have the most experience knowledge in this and then of course mark clark then wraps it up with uh isn't it narrow minded to say that jesus is the only way so lots of incredible talent coming so so get these on your calendars make sure you don't miss church hey bring that what a great opportunity to bring that friend who is just saying you guys are crazy this is nuts this is a perfect series for them and maybe you're here right now and you're saying this is crazy this is nuts i'm glad you're here uh so one of the greatest experts on this and by the way everybody get your notes out uh, because you're going to take a lot of notes today, so make sure your pen is ready. Uh, Pastor Kurt Harlow, this is on the four attacks on the Bible and how to answer each. He's been doing this and talking about this for over 30 years, primarily to the college level students who are in that prime age, right, of saying and challenging their faith from 18 to 22. So uh, we are going to have him teach. He's going to be on video today. We are not a campus that runs video teaching. It's very rare. But on occasion, when the two, our two pastors come together, we say, we need to hear the best teacher on this. So today, Kurt will be on video uh, and going right back to live next week. So please just sit back, uh, relax, get your pencils out, and let's, uh, let's launch Pastor Kurt Harlow. Hello, good morning, Blue Oaks, my all-time favorite campus, except for maybe Auburn. If you haven't heard, we're starting a new base site in Auburn. Yours truly is heading up the launch team. If you know someone from Auburn or any of that area, you know, Auburn or Loomis or Grass Valley or Cool or Colorado, make sure you tell them about our new Auburn campus. But today, I'm here at Blue Oaks, and I wanted to say, Kayla did an amazing job at worship. Come on, give it up for Kayla. And as handsome as he is, can we all agree that Jason Crow looks even more handsome in a 49ers jersey? That's right, he's a handsome man. But moving that aside, let's get right to it because I've got a lecture format for you today. That's right, don't be afraid of a lecture. We've got a lot of content today because we're starting out our skeptical series. So we're going to speak up and get into some of the most incredible content about why you can trust Christianity, starting with, is the Bible reliable? Turn to your neighbor and say, turn on your frontal lobe, because our topic is simply this, four attacks on the Bible and how to answer each. Now, attacks, that might be a little aggressive. There are attacks out there, very aggressive attacks on the Bible. But most people with the questions that I'm going to answer today, they're not really attacking the Bible. They've gotten some misinformation or made some assumptions or they just have real honest questions. So I'm taking the four most common ones I've run into over three and a half decades of working with university students and I'm gonna articulate each one and then answer each one. It's kind of like a funeral, <laughs> what do I mean by that? 
I've experienced this, and, and you know, I know we call them celebrations of life now or memorials. I prefer the old-fashioned word funeral because there's some grief that goes on in a funeral. There is some connecting with our mortality that is hard when we celebrate the life of a loved one. And what I've found is there's three stages to the American funeral. The first stage is kind of that awkward silent stage. We show up at the church or the funeral center and no one knows what to say and we shake hands and we give hugs and we find our seat. And then the ceremony begins and we hear from loved ones. And I wanna tell you, 30 plus years of doing this, some of the most profound thoughts I've ever ha had or heard have happened at funerals. People get up and they start sharing about their loved ones and something incredible happens. I start to examine my life. I start to open up to this best known of all facts, I'm going to die. I start contemplating what will they say about me at my funeral and what should I learn from this person who lived their life and how can I make the most of every day? A powerful thing happens at a good funeral. Then you get to the third stage of a funeral, and that stage is the eating stage, at least at American funerals. To do our grief, we wanna go right into a buffet, and we're piling it on, and we're eating. At some point, if you stay long enough, at the end of the buffet, someone will say, Pastor Kurt, what happens when we die? I love that moment. I live for that moment. It doesn't always happen at a funeral. Sometimes it happens in a dorm at 1 a.m. Sometimes it happens at a family reunion. Sometimes it happens just between two close friends, but they happen a lot at funerals. And in that moment, I've learned just to share simply what the Bible says. The Bible teaches there is a God. The Bible teaches that we've sinned. The Bible teaches that God came to earth, Jesus, and died for our sin, and the Bible teaches that we must accept Jesus Christ as Lord. That's the gospel. And inevitably, someone in that honest moment will say, but Pastor Kurt, is that really what the Bible says? Or Pastor Kurt, can we trust the Bible? Or Pastor Kurt, I heard that the Bible was changed. These are my favorite moments. When people get honest enough, not in a spirit of debate, to actually ask their real questions. I've found there are four dominant questions. There's a lot more than this, but there are four dominant questions out there. Here they are, I'm gonna go through all four of them, and then boom, 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 we're gonna examine each and give you the answer on how to respond to each one. Here they are, the four attacks on the Bible. Number one, the Bible is filled with fable and myth. This is Thomas Jefferson and Richard Dawkins and Chris Hitchens, the, the new atheist. You know, Thomas Jefferson, he cut all the supernatural events out of his New Testament. And this, this is just an easy idea. It says, we can't trust the Bible because we know supernatural events don't happen and there's supernatural events in the Bible. We will be answering that one. The second one is, the New Testament was created long after Jesus' life by Constantine and some evil bishops and priests and cardinals in their little back rooms. And this argument kind of goes like this. Rome is falling apart. Constantine comes in. He's kind of a Christian. He cobbles together some of the Christian fables that are left over. And he creates this new state religion to hold together the disintegrating Roman Empire. And it happens in the fourth century, 300 years after the life of Christ. You might have uh, heard the Da Vinci Code, Dan Brown. This is the argument that Dan Brown makes in the Da Vinci Code. Uh, Voltaire, the famous um, philosopher, he also believed in this sort of question. The third one is the Bible endorses slavery, violence, genocide, injustice, and all manner of evil. It seems like especially in the Old Testament. God is angry and mean and jealous and petty. Is the God of the Old Testament angry and mean and jealous and petty? Is he immoral? What's our answer to that one? Of course, Richard Dawkins, Chris Hitchens, Sam Harris, uh, we, we could go on with a, a group called the New Atheists. They all major in this argument. That's their number one argument. And the last one is this. The Bible has been corrupted and changed dramatically over many decades. Oftentimes, this argument is made by people that 
Uh, they say they're friends of the Bible and they love the Bible. It just can't be trusted. It's just been changed. There's so many different ancient manuscripts. How do you know which one to believe? This is the argument that comes out of the great biblical scholar, uh, Bart Erdman, and uh, the popular pastor now turned liberal theologian, Rob Bell. Has the Bible been changed? Has ancient Christianity been lost? Do we have a careful and accurate record of what Jesus really believed and taught and what the early church fathers and apostles practiced? Well, we'll see. Now, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm gonna get right into it. You better be ready to take some notes. I've given you an extensive note page. Pull that out, fill in those blanks. If you don't get all the blanks, go back and look at the video later. If you're still with me, give me an amen. All right, let's go. Number one, the Bible is just fable and myth. Here's the answer right off the bat. This claim is based on an anti-supernatural bias and a misunderstanding of what defines fable, legend, and myth in literature. Okay, so let's take the first part of the answer. It just simply means I don't believe in anything supernatural, therefore I immediately reject all of the New Testament especially because it can't be true. It's got supernatural events in it. Now, this really isn't a bad argument, and it's an argument that we should have. It's a debate and discussion that we should have, but it's not an argument against the New Testament. It's an argument against theism. This is an argument for atheistic materialism. Now, let's be really careful in our terms. Atheistic materialism doesn't mean people that don't believe in God but love to shop. No, atheistic materialism means I believe that there is only material in the universe. There is nothing above and beyond time, space, or matter. There's no extra level or, or any part of the universe that we don't understand in terms of matter. Now, there's two kind of really problems with this. Number one is the problem that it's anti-investigative. The second you say, I'm rejecting all of it before we even investigate the, the actual relationship between agnosticism and atheism and deism and theism is, uh, well, it's just not the smartest way to go about it. Shouldn't we have the conversation? The other problem, as I stated, is that this is about a bias, not about an evidence. Now, atheists might disagree with me on this, but let's just look really clearly and carefully, and we're gonna do a whole week on this, about some simple evidence for God. Here's my first evidence. You are here. Nothing comes from nothing. I can't tell you how many smart students I meet on college campuses that believe the atheistic, materialistic point of view and I'm like, listen, you're 18 years old and you know the size of the earth, right? And you know the size of our solar system, right? And you know the size of our galaxy, right? And you know that our solar system is on the edge of this tiny little galaxy. And you know that there's many, 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 many more galaxies. And you can, you can actually be assured that of all of these galaxies and all of this one universe, you have figured out there's nothing out there but material. You know this for a fact. Shouldn't you be a little bit more open-minded? You know, sometimes our science is so good, it answers questions we were not smart enough to ask. I love science. We're gonna do a whole week on science and faith. Don't miss that week. But my starting position is this. Have you read both sides? I meet these students and man, they've read all the new atheists. They've read the biggest scholars on the skeptical, uh, atheistic, materialistic side. And I'm like, who have you read on the theist side? Who have you read that's arguing that nothing comes from nothing and that the multiverse philosophy, and that's what it is, has no direct evidence to it? Who are you reading about the expansion of the universe, which means there's something other than our universe? Who are you reading on the classical arguments for the existence of God? And they're like, uh, I saw this guy once on Instagram in his mother's basement. Here's my only question to ask of the skeptic. Do all the reading you want on the new atheist. Do all the reading you want on there is only material and there's never supernatural. But open yourself to do the same level of reading with the most credible sources on the theistic side. Read Mark Clark. Read Timothy Keller. Read, we're gonna buy bibliographies every week. We're gonna list some books you can read. 
get these into your life. Now, the second half of this argument about the idea of fable and myth just has to do with literature, literary uh, understanding. What is fable? What is myth? What is the difference between Midas's touch, that old fable, uh, or Hercules, that old Greek fable, and the New Testament? Well, just to make this argument really quickly, C.S. Lewis, one of the greatest literary minds of our time, he was very skeptical about this idea that the New Testament especially was fable and myth. And the reason is he was an expert in fable, myth, and legend. He knew what it looked like. And he's like, this doesn't read like fable and myth. When you read the book of John, for instance, it doesn't read like fable and myth. He says this, I have been reading poems, romances, vision literature, legends, and myths all of my life. I know what they are like. I know that not one of them is like the Gospel of John. In other words, the Gospel of John is too human. The Gospel of John is too detailed. When Jesus heals the leper, he says, go and show yourselves to, to the religious leaders so you can be embraced back into the community. This level of detail is not typical of legend, myth, and fable literature. Okay. Number one, is the Bible just supernatural fable? Let's move on to the next one. Number two, the New Testament was created long after Jesus' life by Constantine and um, the religious leaders in Rome. Uh, there's a guy, he, he, he got on the internet after one of our The Bible uh, podcasts we were doing a few years ago, and he actually refuted what we were teaching there, and he said this, at the instruction of the Emperor Constantine, the New Testament was compiled at the Council of Nicaea, 325 AD. A group of Christian leaders edited a selection of all these lores, in other words, fables and myths, about an influential spiritual leader called Jesus that had lived three centuries earlier. Four of these stories served as the basis of this treatment. Those Jesus stories that did not fit the Roman purpose were labeled uncanonical, not a part of the canon or the standard of authentic Christianity. And the empire then attempted to destroy all the alternative gospels, the gospel of Thomas and the gospel of Mary. And that sounds pretty convincing, doesn't it? Constantine and these guys got together and said, we got to pull Rome together. Let's use these fables from Jesus. We'll pick which ones we want. We'll throw out the ones that don't fit. We'll get Corinth in there. We'll edit the Corinthian letters a little bit. That's part of this argument. Now, is this made by a great historian, a great scholar? No, this argument was made by a guy using the handle Taco on our Bayside YouTube channel. It's a very old and very popular argument, by the way. In fact, this is an argument that is made exactly by the Da Vinci Code, where, you know, Tom, that movie where Tom Hanks has got the mullet in it, kind of almost like my mullet. Here's the answer to this question of, did Constantine create Christianity instead of Jesus? By the fourth century, there were too many Christians to hijack the well-established faith. Furthermore, the apostles' insistence on the rule of faith, make sure you fill that blank in carefully, the rule of faith, we're coming back to that ensured that, that authentic Christianity survived. So what, what are we talking about here? Um, the idea that Christianity was somehow lost is sort of uh, historical arrogance. We don't really understand the amount of people and the amount of time and the amount of persecution that those people held on to their Christian faith. I'm going to go to a guy named Rodney Stark. He's the number one expert on um, kind of the populations of the first century. He says, if we accept 60 million as the total population at 300 AD, the beginning of the fourth century, which is the most widely accepted estimate, this would mean that there are 6 million Christians at the start of the fourth century. See, the clear point is this. Between the death of Jesus and 325, when Constantine was doing all of his things, there were was, there was 6 million Christians that were learning their Bible, had access to early manuscripts, had developed the doctrines of the church in a very, very profound and succinct way, and there's no way one edict from one leader could change 6 million minds. Too many bishops, too many pastors, too many communities over three different continents. You still don't believe me? 
Well, let me go to a guy named Dr. Bart Erdman. Now, Dr. Bart Erdman, hang in me, hang in. I'm giving a lot of information though, but hang in with me. Dr. Bart Erdman and I disagree about most things. But on this one theory, was Christianity created late by Constantine and his cabal? Here's what Dr. Bart Erdman says. Emperor Constantine had nothing to do with the formation of the canon of scripture. He did not choose which books to include or ex to exclude, and he did not order the destruction of gospels that were left out of the canon. The pastor Kurt, I've heard about this mysterious gospel of Thomas, and I've heard about the gospel of Mary. Didn't they excluded that because she was a woman and they were all women haters? Well, that's a whole nother topic, and boy, could we have a great conversation about that. But let me talk about the gospel of Thomas as a, as a, very, very good example of this problem that, you know, Constantine and the people in Rome wanted to burn some gospels and keep them out and wanted to favor some gospels. The Gospel of Thomas is not accepted by any scholar as being written at the same time and with the same authority as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In fact, the Gospel of Thomas is not a narrative. It doesn't tell the story of Jesus. It has a bunch of mysterious sayings about Jesus. The Gospel of Thomas, and you won't find this out by reading the Wikipedia page on it, is written in an entirely different type of handwriting. And that handwriting is a much later handwriting than what we have in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. It's different. In fact, it's Gnosticism. Uh, as scholars that are honest about this go, you know, what Thomas was, it was Gnostic people. This is a Greek religion going, wow, Jesus is picking up in some popularity. Let's add Jesus into our thinking and we'll produce a Jesus document and maybe we'll get some Christians on the Gnostic side. That's an oversimplification, but essentially what's true, the Gospel of Thomas and many other of these Gospels are much later and they're written from a Gnostic point of view, not with the credibility of the apostles, their disciples, and the early church fathers. Okay, I gotta move forward here and talk about one last thing. The rule of faith. Here's Dr. Matthew Harmon, professor of New Testament studies, Grace Theological Seminary. Dr. Uh, Harmon is one of my favorites on this topic. The gospel message, or the rule of faith, as the early church sometimes called it, is what gave birth to the inspired documents that comprise our New Testament. In other words, from the very beginning, especially Paul's very early writings, we can see this aggressive, powerful value in the apostles and the early disciples, and then the early church fathers to say, we will not let go of the authentic teaching of Christ. The early church fathers called this the rule of faith. Are you in the rule of faith? Are you teaching Jesus? Are you outside of the rule of faith? Where do we see this? Well, we see it, first of all, in the gospel stories themselves. The most famous is Matthew 28, 19, and 20. When we read this passage, we say, therefore, go, we're adventurous, go, make disciples. But what the early church heard was, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. From the beginning, they knew their job was to teach everything Jesus taught. That's the rule of faith. John 14, 15, here it is now again at the end of Jesus' life. And Jesus says this, if you love me, what? Keep my commands. Don't invent new commands. Don't start with new teachings. If you love me, keep my commands. Paul is the one you see the rule of faith in the most, and I think it's because he was the last of all apostles. And so Paul wants to make sure that he's teaching what the apostles in Jerusalem are teaching. So he says things like this, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. That's 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. He says, holding on to the tradition that has been passed on to you. That's the rule of faith. What is Paul here? Sometimes we read this with our ears and we're like, Paul's so arrogant. Paul's like, yeah, but follow me because I got it. I'm following Christ and I got it and you don't, you don't. No, Paul's not being arrogant. He's saying what Peter and John gave me, don't deviate from. Follow me 
is I follow the people that passed it on directly from Jesus. We go on and on with this. Paul says in Galatians, even if an angel should preach a different gospel, don't do it. The things you have heard me say, entrust to reliable witnesses who will entrust the reliable witnesses who will entrust that 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. I received from the Lord what I passed on to you, 1 Corinthians. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. That's also 1 Corinthians. Peter in the rule of faith calls Paul's writings scripture. And in the early church fathers, we get example after example after example where they say, don't deviate, don't deviate. Um, by the end of the first century, Dr. Harmon says, there are collections of Paul's letters circulating among a large number of churches in the ancient world. Many churches would have possessed copies of one, if not more, of the Gospels. These documents were recognized as authoritative scripture for believers. In other words, they didn't get the Bible 300 years after Jesus. They got this ethic, this value, the rule of faith, and the early manuscripts very, very early. The organized church did not create the canon, the standard, the list, of New Testament books, it recognized the canon that had been created. That's Dr. Kurt Alland, renowned German New Testament scholar. I could go on and on and on and on. Okay, let's review, I promise. We're gonna land this. It's been a lot, everyone take a breath. Let your frontal lobe, you know, kinda rest for a second. Let's review, just because the Bible has miracles doesn't mean it's false. The New Testament doesn't read like myth or legend. It reads like real life. And the, the debate between atheism and theism is a vigorous, important debate of which there are profound and great arguments for theism. Don't miss the week we talk about that. Secondly, there were too many Christians in too many communities learning with early manuscripts at the rule of faith for, the, for Christianity to be formed in the fourth century. The fourth century recognized what the church had done. It didn't create what the church had done. Also, the apostles and early church fathers did an excellent job, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to be committed to the authentic teachings of Jesus. We see this in their writing over and over again. All right, two more arguments. Here we go. The Bible endorses slavery, violence, genocide, and injustice. This is one I see all the time. I, I can't tell you how many students that have never had a Bible class, never even cracked a Bible, but they've heard something from an English professor or someone in humanities, and they go, oh, the Old Testament God's a different God than the New Testament God. Old Testament God, he's mean, and he's chaotic, and he, he wants to kill all those poor, kind, nice little Canaanites. And the New Testament God, He's just got a lamb on his shoulders and he's got a well-groomed beard and he's got great laundromats because his, his robe is always clean and white and nothing could be further from the much more complex and important story of God throughout both Old and New Testament. Now, oftentimes when we hear this argument, um, it's made along the lines of a misunderstanding of Old Testament text. It's primarily in the Old Testament. It proof texts some texts. It takes one proof text means it just takes one text out and says this is the way God is based on this paragraph, this chapter. Uh, it takes a challenging passage and refuses to apply the right exegetical, that's a literary interpretation that's accurate, the right exegetical uh, treatment of the passage. And sometimes it's just about in, in uh, translating through our postmodern sensibilities to an iron and bronze age culture. So here's our answer. The Bible is written for us, but not to us. To understand these challenging Old Testament passages accurately, we need three key exegetical, again, exegetical means the proper heart and the proper tools to get the proper meaning of the passage. We need three key exegetical tools, three key exegetical understandings. 
Here they are. And by the way, this will apply to every passage that you have, but it's especially true for these challenging passages where it seems like God is more given to being a judgmental God. Here's the first one. Not everything in the Old Testament describes what God prescribes. You know, the Old Testament is amazing because unlike most ancient literature, it's honest. Most ancient literature paints its heroes in the most and best light. It, it doesn't record the defeats. It only records the victories. This is why you have very, very little recording of any time any Egyptian army got defeated. And, and even the leaders, like I had a professor in art school and he said, look at the statues of all the leaders from ancient cultures all around the world. All the leaders, they got broad shoulders and broad chins and they stand taller than everyone and they got muscles. There's no weight rooms back in ancient Babylonia, but they got muscles on muscles. Even our own founding fathers, George Washington, and all those guys, their busts are in togas with broad shoulders and, and big chins. And, and you know, George Washington wasn't this way. He was an old man with gout and wooden teeth, but yet we've got him like a Roman God. Why do we do that? To intimidate our enemies. Because we, we use the authority of our art to actually project our leadership. There's one um, pharaoh out there, and you can go look him up. And uh, my professor used to call him the honest pharaoh. He's Akhenaten. And Akhenaten, he's portrayed with this ginormous gut. To the point where some people theorize maybe he's a pregnant woman, uh, maybe he has some sort of genetic disease. Whatever it was, he told his artist, I'm letting it all hang out there. He's got this big gut, big belly button. His shoulders are small. He's the only one that's honest. Frequently, as we read the Old Testament, we are shocked. And the reason we're shocked is because the Old Testament doesn't do any of this goofy stuff. It doesn't portray David as perfect. David and Bathsheba, it's right in there. It doesn't portray Abraham as perfect. He manipulates and lies. In fact, all of the characters are seen as three-dimensional. So oftentimes when evil happens in the Old Testament, it's not that God is prescribing that as a method or strategy. He's describing honestly what truly happened in Bronze and Iron Age culture. The second point is this. Often the language of war in the Old Testament is hyperbolic. In other words, if you take the literature of the time and you take how people talked about war, God speaks to the Israelites in a way that they can hear. He uses the language of the day. They understood. He understood what it meant. We read it and think it means something that it doesn't mean. There's much been written on this. Uh, if you want to read a great book on this, Is God a Moral Monster by Paul Copen. Is God a Moral Monster by Paul Copen. That's a great place to start, start about the argument of hyperbolic war language in the Old Testament. And finally, beware of anthropomizing the motives of God. Anthropomizing means we just make God more like us and less like God. God sees all. I do not see all. God understands from generation to generation to generation what will happen if this doesn't happen. I don't. What is wrong for me to do is not wrong for God to do in his foresight and sovereign understanding. Where do those instances exist? I don't know. And I don't know because you don't want me making those decisions. You don't want someone with my SAT scores making the decisions of life and death. But understand this. God was jealous about protecting this powerful truth. Monotheism. That worshiping false idols and false gods led to extremely cruel and destructive culture. And that worshiping and discovering the real God must be protected passionately, vigorously. All right, there's so much more we could say about that, but our time is running out. You ready for the last argument? Okay, we've talked about this argument of did Christianity get disqualified because we got miracles in there, and we've answered that. And we talked about did Christianity get invented in the fourth century? And we've talked about that. Is the God of the Old Testament mean and somehow different than the God of the Old New Testament? We begin to talk about that. And here's our final one. The Bible has changed over many years. This is the one I run into the most. 
So I say to someone, you know, the Bible teaches this. And they go, well, how do you know? Because we all know the Bible's changed so many times over so many years. And the idea here is that you have these evil monks. We're all nice and kind. And if it was our job to copy the Bible, we'd do a great job of it. But everyone knows that every monk for all of history was evil and had agendas. And they're all in these little rooms with one little candle with their little feather pen going, I, ha, ha, I know better than Jesus. And they're changing all these manuscripts. And now oh, we can't even begin to even believe that perhaps we have the real Bible, well, let me just give you some really good news. We have the real Bible. The Bible in your hands has been shown over and over and over and over again to be in substance the same exact Bible Christians have had from the very beginning. Here's the answer. More than any other ancient manuscript, the Bible has thousands of surviving copies that demonstrate great continuity and doctrinal agreement. Unlike any other, you, you, you pick a Homer, uh, the Iliad, the Odyssey, all of that stuff, unlike any of the other ancient documents, it's not even comparable. They have four, five, six, eight manuscripts. We have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands. See, this claim that we've lost the Bible represents a very persistent misunderstanding that I find on almost every college campus with every college student. You probably find it around your dinner table. and and. It's simply not true. Let me give you just one example of it's, why it's not true. And this has to do with a city called Oxyrhynchus. Oxyrhynchus. It's an Egyptian city. And see, what happened is in the 1800s, 19th, early 19th century, mid 19th century, a bunch of uh, English guys that had too much money in spare time said, you know what we ought to do? We ought to go over to Egypt and we ought to just plunder all their ancient sites and we ought to drag their statues over here. Sorry, English, you did it. I'm sorry. A lot of us did it, but you guys really did it. And they started plundering and plundering and plundering. So, of course, they went to Giza and they went to the pyramids and they dug and they plundered that sort of stuff. And after a while, these two guys, a guy named Grenfeld and a guy named Hunt, they said, you know what? All the popular spots have been taken. Let's go to this city called Oxyrhynchus. And why go there? because no one else has ever gone there. Why did no one else ever gone there? Because, well, people believed there was nothing there. In fact, it was an old Egyptian city that they had cut the Nile off of many years before, and therefore it dried up, it was arid, and there was no culture there, no civilization there for a long time, so why even bother go look? And they showed up and said, well, just give it a try. And guess what they found? They found garbage. <laughs> they found everyone was right. There was no pyramids there. There was no incredible. There was garbage heaps. But guess what was in those very dry, very well-preserved garbage heaps? Thousands of manuscripts relating to early Christianity. In fact, this is why we have 5,800 different Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. There's even more Greek manuscripts in the Latin. There's even more in the quotations of the early church fathers. We are so wealthy in early church manuscripts that date back to almost the very beginning of Christianity. And not only that, in this city, they found so much Greek, many, many other languages too, that it increased our understanding of the Greek language. So not only did we get many, many more manuscripts of the New Testament, we got better translations, more accurate translations. Now, I want you to think about this for just a second. I'm gonna go all the way back to the argument of theism. Is there a God? Is this, is, are we alone in the universe? Or can we never know agnosticism? Who knows if there's a God? Or deist, there's evidence for a God, but he never speaks, he doesn't like us, he's off doing something else. Or could there be evidence that not only is there a God, but he loves you? Think about this. All of these manuscripts, perfectly preserved. Now, you would expect variants, and every once in a while, you'll hear this argument, there's 200 to 400,000 variants in all of the manuscripts of the New Testament, and it sounds very daunting. Oh no, 400,000 differences. Well, 90% of these, over 90% of these variants, 
don't matter at all. Over 90% of these variants are a space or a spelling or a non-transmittable point, a uh, translatable point. Here's Dr. Matthew Harmon again. The overwhelming majority of variants found in the manuscripts are mistakes in spelling, differences in word order, or the use of synonyms that have absolutely no effect on the meaning of the passage. In fact, one of these variants that occurs is there's a different spelling of the name John. One has two N's, one only has one N, and that happens over and over again. And you want to know why there's so many? Because we have so many manuscripts. If there was only two or three manuscripts, we'd have very little variants. But because we have thousands, there are many variants. And these variants do not change any doctrine. Think about this. If you had for 1400 years, people by candlelight on parchment paper using fragile materials copying the Bible over and over and over and over and over again. You would expect variants. You would expect a space or a misspelling here or there. Even a verse or a comment added, and there are some of those. What you wouldn't expect is agreement. You wouldn't expect the teaching of Jesus to be coherent, for Paul to agree with Peter, for James and Paul to act in concert, for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to bring such a beautiful, holistic, and powerful agreement to this historical fact. God loves us so much, he preserved his message for us because he wanted us to know that he lived, he taught, he died on a cross, and he defeated death for you and for me.